Hello and welcome to the Perry Connection. I'm your host, Jesse Barth. And with me in the studio is Bob Murphy from Silver Lake. Welcome, Bob. Yes, thank you. I'm so glad you're here. You have some beautiful photographs of the way it used to be yes. on Walker Road at Silver Lake in Perry, New York. Yes. Or I should say in Silver Lake, <laughs> New York, which is next door to Perry, New York. <laughs> yeah. So, but before we, we look at, at this, tell me about you. I know you're a historian. You're, you have quite an interesting background. Can you just tell us about yourself? Well, I was born Walker Road, grew up on Walker Road, as did my father, as did my grandfather, and my great-grandfather came there. So the Murphys have been on Walker Road for a long time. Uh, when I got married, I moved up to the Silver Lake Institute with my wife, but I had a business that I ran on Walker Road for uh, 27 years. Really? Okay. Yes. Um, so you've seen a lot of changes right. on Walker Road since you came <laughs> along uh, as part of the, the Murphy family. So we're going to talk about th those changes and your life and um, what a legacy. And you're a historian. Are you the historian for Silver Lake? I'm the historian for the Silver Lake Institute, the museum at the Hogarth Gallery. Do mostly I do writings and display photographs that deal with the history of the Silver Lake Institute. And then I'm a vice president trustee for the Pioneer Association at the Log Cabin on Walker Road, where I took over for Clark Rice, and I do the historical photograph there and write history. I write different articles under a title called Life in a Ten-Cent World. <laughs> Life deals, at a Ten-Cent World. In a Ten-Cent World. In a Ten-Cent World. It deals from 1890 <laughs> to about 1964. After that, we went off the gold standard, and, and the dime became an entirely different insignificant coin. <laughs> I remember as a kid, right. you could get you could get some sizable candy bars for yeah. 10 cents people, for a dime. Yeah, people, a dime was a lot of money. Kids could go out and earn a dime. You got two or three dimes, you could go to the roller rink for a quarter. Yeah. <laughs> so a dime was a lot. Now, nah. Well, so uh, tell me about your childhood growing up on, on Walker Road. Well, luckily I grew up next to the uh, grocery store. It was a Lounsbury, it was Pombert's when I was young, and then it became Lounsbury's. It was the longest-running mom-and-pop grocery store in the village of Perry. And it was probably the biggest mom-and-pop grocery store in the village of Perry. And where, where was that located? That was about two-thirds of the way down Walker Road. Now, when I talk about Walker Road, I'm referring from the standpipe all the way up to where it becomes the Silver Lake Institute. Okay. Uh, about two-thirds of the way down to the grocery store. It's gone now. It was torn down about four or five years ago, the building that was the grocery store. Um, and how many people were, were living at Silver Lake um, at that time? When I was growing up, I sat down last year and tried to make a list of just the kids that were from ages of 5 to 18 in, my, uh, uh, in the 50s growing up. There was 164 on the Walker Euclid Road. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, so you always had fun, someone to play with. Of course, most of Walker Road was like an amusement park. You had the first, um, what well, is now the Perry Public Beach, but originally it had a uh, dance hall with a uh, nine-pin uh, bowling alley underneath it. You put coins in, pull the little lever, it was sort of like ski ball, only you were knocking over pins. Next to that was the Manor on the Lake restaurant. And then you went to the Walker property. He had another dance hall called the Rustic Dance Hall and a lakefront with a large slide. He had the largest, most elaborate hotel in the county. And he had an amusement park area. Mr. Walker. He was Mr. quite an Walker. entrepreneur. Wasn't yes, he? he was. Now, is this the... That's the lakefront in front of the Walker. Can we talk about this and see if we have a good angle here with our trusty cameraman Joe here? Yeah, okay. Can you talk about this photo? Well, you'd go down and uh, cross the railroad track, so the railroad went through everything. And uh, boat livery was Henry's boat livery. In my day, it was Stan Hall's, but it was all part of the Walker complex. And then they had this large slide there that my father used to tell me about. You went up, and you sat on this little board. It had wheels on it, and then you shot down <laughs> the slide like a toboggan and skipped across the water. <laughs> Woohoo! And if you lived, you ran back up and did it again. <laughs> did you have to pay for that? 
Yes, it was, you had to pay to do that. And was it a dime? <laughs> it was probably about a dime or maybe even a nickel. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't much. Wow. Because you could go to the rink in the 50s for a quarter. So. Wow. It just, um, it, I don't want to say it, but it's almost like a ghost town now in that that you it's don't all, have all the business. It's 99% residential, other yeah. than the two campgrounds and the Pioneer Museum. All the retail is gone. My comic book shop that I had on Walker Road for 27 years, which was just a glorified hobby. I always had to work a real job on the side. And what was that? What was your real job? I was a darkroom tech for years until the digital aid made us darkroom guys obsolete. Okay. Uh, I guess they call that progress. <laughs> And then I went into um, uh, doing uh, uh, superintendent work for the Silver Lake Institute for 12 years, and I ended up as a janitor at BOCES for 12 years. Okay. But I spent 24 years in the dark room. Mm -hmm. And I do all the photo work. I do it all on computers now. All these oh, are computer-generated. Okay. I scan all these photographs I gather and, and then try to blow them up as big as I can so people can see them better. And see the detail. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So... Silver Lake was a real destination yes, place. And, um, Perry became the biggest um, industrial town in the county after the merchants built the railroad. Prior to that, they just they had businesses here, but they were local businesses. You had flax mills, tanneries, sawmills. These are the type of things that built up in a small community for local consumption. Right, to support the community. Right, the flax was very big. They made fiber. One factory made fibers. The other took the fibers and made it into ropes and linen cloth. And the third factory took the seeds and made them into oil. And then the sawmills, of course, they were clearing the land for farming. You needed sawmills. And leather was very big and clothing. And so you had two tanneries. In fact, And you're talking 1800s Yeah, 1800 by... Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then you start get up where entrepreneurs come in and they want to have factories like the Knitting Mill or Robeson's. Mm -hmm. But to do that, you have to be able to get your supplies in and get your supplies out. Right, your products. And wagon was very slow to do that. You'd have to load things on a wagon and take it to a canal. And the closest canal was probably Mount Morris to haul your stuff to. Okay or possibly to where the railroad was coming in, to a railroad depot, and they wanted a railroad spur brought into Perry more for convenience. All the other towns in the county had a spur off the railroad except for Perry. So what did Perry do? Perry did something really stupid. First they went together with <laughs> some other towns that. by today's standards. <laughs> they, they, they went with the Silver Springs in Gainesville to build spurs, but the other towns backed out and just built their own. So Perry was left hanging the bag for the spurs. So the merchants got together and they raised money and they sold bonds. They acquired easements along the lake because it was on the east side. It was all farmland then. There was no cottage oh, okay. or anything near, no roads. Oh, really? Okay. And uh, so they were able to get the easements there and built a five and a half mile uh, track into Silver Springs and created their own Silver Lake Railroad. And, and let's just say this again. This, these were just individuals who gathered together, right. who were self-reliant and industrious, and they yeah. said, we need it, we're going to do it ourselves. No crying to the government for money and help right. and stuff. It they was, needed isn't it, that fun? and they did it. Yeah. And it opened Perry to become the biggest industrial town in the county because Perry had year-round water supply. And so the mills could grow, the Deercraft, Robus, and the Knitting Mill, eventually Archway, and the Costine, and Borden, mm -hmm. and all these different plants came in. Of course, the Ice House grew to, uh, hired about 150 to 200 people. Okay. It was the biggest Ice House in the, in the state. Okay. And you don't have a picture of the Ice House? Yes, I do. Oh. Okay. Well, at some point, let's, let's get that okay. if we can. But... Uh, give give me some dates. When was the railroad built? 1872, the railroad opened for business, which was the same year that Mr. Walker built his new hotel up on Walker Road, which was why Walker Road is Walker Road. Okay. All uh, right. Do I have a picture of the new hotel, I think? Of the Walker Hotel? It yeah. should be. Is this it? Yep, that's one angle of it. And this is the other angle. No, that's no. the art lip in. Okay, well, I'm going to show this angle, and while I'm doing that, maybe you can go and get a picture of the ice, um, the ice place, 
Ice factory? Is that what they called it? The ice factory? The ice house. Somebody ice house. Ice house. So, so many people were employed by Silver Lake. Well, the railroad up. caused Perry to grow, and people forget that the Walker area was part of the village of Perry. Okay. It was also in the town of Castile, but... Okay. And here's a, another a dining room at the Walker house. Quite elegant. And how many restaurants were there? Well, there were seven hotels, but there were other restaurants like Maggie's and hot dog stands all up and down the street. <laughs> Maggie Adams with the biggest hot dog stand was there for almost 55 years. Really? It was uh, like a Bill Gray's. Uh-huh. Yeah. It was sort of fast food yeah, in a slower and time. And... So, okay, so did you get the, uh, the ice house picture yet? Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, let's show. This is my one of my favorite ones that you've um, brought, and this was from Helen Penner, I guess, in 1934. Right. She and was, this this was at the amusement park. And did you say that As part of the two? Walker, you had the Walker place. You had the Maggie Adams section and the Tucker section. The Tuckers had a roller rink, a lakefront the Grove Hotel and Restaurant, and a merry-go-round. And it was a steam-driven merry-go-round, and about 1948, 49, about the year I was born, they discontinued the merry-go-round and got rid of it, but they took the steam part of it, the calliope that was inside of it, and put it inside the roller rink to play on the balcony up above the <laughs> skating floor. And they used it for a couple of years until the fire marshal showed up one year and said, you cannot have a steam-driven Clypey inside this wooden building and made them take it out. Oh, probably <laughs> a good idea. I have to say, I, this is the wrong hand here. I love this picture of, of the little boy here. And that is your uncle, correct? Yes, that's my uncle. Look at that. If that's not an all-American little boy, from Perry, New York, Silver Lake. And what was his name? Danny. Danny. Danny Murphy? Danny Murphy. Yeah, beautiful shot. So Americana, isn't it? Okay, so the um, did you find the ice house? No, I no? didn't Okay, the well then we, we won't worry about that. But tell me about the ice house. Um, the ice house was probably the largest ice house in this part of the state. It was a very big company. They hired 150 to 200 people. Um, and uh, they filled the ice house, and most of that ice was shipped out by rail to Buffalo and Rochester for the summer. Our okay. local ice was mostly done by the Fanning Company, and they had a smaller ice operation that was over near where the Perry Public Beach is. Okay. And they cut their ice, and they had a, a little spur of load of ice into cars so it could be shipped back down to their uh, place in Perry where they stored it. Okay, so... It seems so funny to us now, you know, since we've had re refrigeration for most of our lives, right. you know, our, our, all of our lives. So they, the ice would freeze right. on Silver Lake, and then they would just chuck, they would cut it into they blocks. They would go out every day with horses and plows and keep the snow off it, because if you kept the snow off the ice, it would freeze quicker and be thicker. Okay. And people talk about global warming, but when you read the history of the ice house, there were years when they cut no ice because the lake never froze. Oh, so how do you so start business? That, that that was tough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And um, but uh, the ice would get quite thick. Hopefully, up to three feet, two or three feet is what they liked. And the guys would go out and they would cut it, and it went on the conveyor belts up to the big ice house to be stored in sawdust and then uh, be shipped out from there. They had a fire on the first ice house after about 20 years, and Clark Rice writes that the ice house burnt, but there was so much ice in it that it just all melted into one great huge lump, and it took four months for that lump of ice to melt away. Really? Even the fire of the ice house burning it down didn't take care of all the ice. Amazing. How did they keep it so cold? Once you cover... 
you take uh, icicles off your house and put them on the ground and cover them with leaves. Come back three months later, and it's probably still going to be there. Really? Okay. It's sort of a, a natural insulation. When I was a boy growing up in the 50s, there were still a few people who used ice boxes. Um, and the ice man would come around, and then in the truck, in the early years, I have pictures mm -hmm. of the wagon, and they would have a tag that you would hang on your window, which meant he would stop, measure your ice box, cut the ice block to fit your particular right. ice box, and, yeah. and put it in there, and it was sold by the pound. Yeah, and it, growing up, you know, I, I heard women call it the ice box instead of the refrigerator, right. the ice box. Hmm. Early television when I used to watch Lassie, and Lassie, <laughs> yeah, the, the original Lassie, they had an ice box in their house, not a refrigerator. Yeah. Yeah. And on the Maggie Adams picture I have here, she had a large ice box because she had a large hot dog stand because a very big ice box. Do you have a, the picture right there? You can put your hands on it. Let's see. I got my Maggie thing. Okay. If you look in the back, that's a nice box. The best way, if you ever go into Holly's restaurant, when you walk directly in, you walk toward an ice box. That big cabinet like thing as you walk in the front door is an ice box. The cabinet. You walk in the front door, get on the steps, and right there in front of you is a large ice okay. box. Really? Okay. So the ice box. And what is this photo again that we're looking this at? This is Maggie Adams. She was the biggest hot dog stand on Walker Road. And what did she sell her hot dogs for? Um, probably a dime. I think they were a dime because I had friends that were older than me. I was only five or six or seven when mm -hmm. she went out. But the older teenagers used to go down there, and if they got there in the morning and got the leftover hot dogs from the day before, they got them for a nickel. <laughs> Half price. <laughs> what memories. What, what fun. Now, um, you had mentioned... Couple things I want to talk about: all the the restaurants and the nightlife. Can you just right? You walked in my father's day, and even in my day. In my day, there was still one dance hall and one roller rink, and um, you would walk down and the hot dog stands and the amusement park. And in my father's day, you'd walk down Walker Road. If you were looking to teen to go out and dance, every hotel had a dance floor and a live band. Um, there was the Royal Dance Hall, the Rustic Dance Hall. The Rustic Dance Hall was primarily the venue for Kelly's Old Timers. They did okay. square dancing there. <laughs> now we're talking dance halls. We're talking big band and square dancing. And we're talking, we're not, so 30s, 30s right, and 30s, 40s. 40s. 30s, right. Okay. Well, from the 20s, 20s 30s, and 30s and 40s, right. And, um, yeah. and you would have the smell of all the hot dog stands because there was probably 20. <laughs> when I was a kid, there were still three hot dog stands, and you could smell the hot dog cooking and the popcorn and the vendors and, and the candy and the custard stand, and, and the Walker property had the amusement park on it, similar to Long Point Park, and that had the dance saucer. And then I remember going to the roller rink one Saturday afternoon with my brother because uh, it was uh, well, Sunday afternoon. It was free on Sunday afternoon for kids 12 and under. As we walked by the dance hall, we heard them practicing. So we went up and peeked in, and the dance hall was almost an identical twin building to the roller rink. Same layout, same okay. everything, same wooden floor. And we looked in, and we saw the bands getting ready for dancing, and we thought, what a waste of a good roller skating floor <laughs> for dancing. <laughs> Those silly people dancing together. Well, what fun. So... Would people come from all over the county? To... All over the county because you had the uh, the beach. Uh, eventually, the venues that were on uh, Perry Public Beach, it wasn't the Perry Public Beach, and they went away and a rotary came in and bought that property and made it into a public beach for the village of Perry. I see, okay. And so we had the Perry Public Beach swimming area, and next to that was Electra School swimming area, and then you got over in front of the walkers, and he still maintained a swimming area. So you had a tremendous amount of diving boards and diving towers, all these things that are not allowed today. Mm -hmm. And swimming lessons? Swimming lessons. I've heard about that. Yes, swimming lessons. Did you learn there. to swim yes, there, right there? Yes, I learned to swim there. I went and started with the first class, and by the third week, I was all the way up to the sixth class. We already knew how to swim quite well. You were natural. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Good. Well, and of course, you can't live in western New York, and Perry is no exception, without a fish fry. 
So I, I love this picture. Oops. Can you talk about this establishment? Um, yeah, that was the Art Lip Inn. It wasn't as big as the Walker Hotel. It was about the size of all the others, and they all had uh, different menus. Their fish fry, and most likely their fish fry was local fish. Because Caught in the lake. In the lake, in Silver Lake, okay. Right. There yeah. wasn't a lot of shipping in of fresh fish back in okay. those days. So That's, did they have fishermen, you know, that were paid to <laughs> probably bring it in? People brought their fish up, they got it, yeah. or at least got enough for just on Friday nights anyhow. I, that's right. Well, may, and maybe that's why they were waiting. And of course, waiting. all of the restaurants or dance halls served liquor, beer. Right. Beer. Um, uh, and this was before Prohibition. Before Prohibition. Can you talk about what Prohibition is, just in case someone... Okay, in the 1930s, uh, the Women's Christian Temperance League, which owned half the pro a lot of property on Walker Road, they were very, very big in pushing to get alcohol made illegal in the United States. Um, and they succeeded. And uh, so alcohol went away. Legally, it went away. <laughs> There's a whole story on the illegal and the speakeasies, and right. there were a lot of them on Walker Road, and a lot of them in Perry. And everybody knew about them, including the law enforcement, and everybody thought the law was stupid, so nobody did anything about it. When you hear about Prohibition and Chicago and New York, where they have all the shooting, that was in the big cities where you had gangs fighting over the turf for alcohol distribution. Once you get out of the cities, there was no battling over alcohol. If you wanted to make it, sell it, you made it and sold it. Okay, so they yep. were entrepreneurs. Yes, they were. And uh, I knew one gentleman, I talked to him when he was 90. He made wine and beer and gin, I mean uh, whiskey. And um, he had to clean up his money so that it was legal. He didn't have the IRS come say, hey, where'd you get all this money that you put in your bank account? He started buying cheap cottages in Old Orchard Beach and around the lake and would hold on them for two or three or four years and then resell them and now his money's all cleaned up to put in the mm -hmm. bank. Mm -hmm. And he became quite wealthy doing that. And who was that? Well, I don't know if I should say his oh, name. Okay. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> well, he's gone now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, you know, there's an, another um, story that has to, that that has to do with Silver Lake and sort of telling stories. I, you probably know where I'm going with yes. this one in regards to... Uh, A.B. Walker. <laughs> yes, Mr. Walker. And and this happened in around the 1850s? 1855. A.B. Walker and some friends, the story goes, at one of the tanneries. It was still open on the outlet. That's where the tanneries were. And um, they built a uh, sea serpent out of coiled wire and canvas, painted it green and yellow, took it to the other side of the lake where there was basically no cottages and sunk it in the water. It had weights on it and then they had a hose that went in to the shore where they were hidden with a large bellows, the bellows we have at our museum that they use. <laughs> and you pump a little air into it and it would make it top, pop to the top and undulate. And as soon as you stop pumping air, the weight would make it sink immediately. And they waited one morning until there were some fishermen close enough to see it come up, but not close enough to see it well. And up it popped, and they saw this large 20-foot thing, and then it sank. And then a little later, it came up 50 feet at a different spot because they had a couple ropes so they could move it back and forth under the water. And uh, so these guys went back and said, there's something really big. It keeps popping up out there. And, of course, they had their cohorts ready to spread the story that there was a large creature in the water, and they said the Seneca Indian, Indians said there was something in the water. That's what they based the story on. And so the reporters came out, interviewed the people who saw the creature in the water, interviewed the then chief of the Seneca Indians, <laughs> and the story spread, and it brought about 10, 15,000 people to the lake that summer looking for the Loch Ness Monster. And Walker had done it to increase business in his hotels, and it worked great. And so how many people were aware that it was a, a jinx, or not a jinx, a hoax? Just probably those who worked on it. Okay. Supposedly one of the Walker houses, he had three, caught on fire, but it didn't burn to the ground, and they found the remains or the, the serpent in the attic of one of the hotels. 
and it came out that the whole thing was a hoax. He built genuine artificial fake sea serpent. <laughs> Well, you know, and, and the, his way of disseminating the news is sort of social media right. of today. You know, you you just have to get it out there and repeat, repeat it. Yes, yeah, so we have the original news articles in our museum along with the bells that was supposedly used. Some people say he never actually built one, that it was just a story. Other people say he actually built it, and that's what the story mm -hmm. came from. Well, and you seem to have the bellows. and Right, the, everything yeah. that went with it, right. Yeah. Now, did, did it just happen that one time, or would it go out? Were there sightings I think over it was, a period uh, of years? Supposedly, or? they did it once more, but then it got, they didn't want to get caught. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. And then um, he had those three hotels, and then when 1872, when the railroad was going to come through, he went up and bought the property and built the first big establishment, which became Walker I Road. I see. Okay. Good. Yeah. I think I think we showed this one, um, but I'll, we'll, we'll just do it again since we're talking Walker Road. I'm not sure that. Yeah, it's Walker Road, probably in the 1920s. Yeah, 1920s. It's just beautiful when you when you look at it today. You know, it's such a different place than when you see the the uh, dirt road and all those trees. It's beautiful, just beautiful, and you know. Places have different, you know, different times of history. You have different, um, you know, they, they adapt to the people, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And this is an example of... That's the ice house, right? Yeah, this is the ice house that was there. That's, that's quite an operation. And they became so successful that they built two more ice houses on Canisius Lake that was called the Silver Lake Ice House, even though they were on Silver Lake, the Silver Lake Ice Company. That's amazing. And Silver Lake also has the state record of being the first lake to freeze in New York State every year. Really? We are at the same altitude as most of the lakes in the Adirondacks. Hmm. They are deeper lakes, they're closer to the east coast, so they don't freeze as quickly. Since we're at the same altitude, the first lake has a record of freezing. Very interesting. Well, you are a wealth of information, and I'm so grateful that you're here to, and so young still, to be able to <laughs> share it with um, with the world and to document it. And and should someone be watching who has um, in their own uh, possession a, a beautiful picture of Silver Lake the way it used to right. be, how could they share that with you? You Bob? can contact me directly, Bob Murphy, at 237-2079. Or you can contact the Wyoming County Historical Association, the Pioneer Cabin. Uh, we're open uh, all summer long, every weekend. And uh, I'm always looking for stories and other photographs. I have a bucket list. I need pictures of the amusements that used to be here. Um, pictures of the dance hall, the rustic dance hall. I only have two partial pictures of the rustic dance hall, but not a good picture of it. And there are many things I'm looking for. Good. Well, we'll have to have you back because I'm sure you could talk hours <laughs> about Silver Lake. And I think we're just sort of scratching the surface. But I'm so grateful that I ran into your lovely wife, Sue, yeah, at yes. the Perry Public Library <laughs> and, um, you know, and then met you through her. So thank you so much and to her okay. and for coming. And, and um, you're, you're a real uh, treasure a resource yep. for us. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us.